He waited. Before his eyes, the engines turned with slow labor that in the moment of going off into a mad fling would stop dead at Mr. Rout's shout. Look out, Beal. They paused in an intelligent immobility, stilled in mid-stroke a heavy crank, arrested on the cant, as if conscious of danger in the passage of time. Then, with a now then from the chief and the sound of a breath expelled through clenched teeth, they would accomplish the interrupted revolution and begin another. There was the prudent sagacity of wisdom and the deliberation of enormous strength in their movements. This was their work, this patient coaxing of a distracted ship over the fury of waves and into the very eye of the wind. At times Mr. Rout's chin would sink on his breast and he watched them with knitted eyebrows as if lost in thought. The voice that kept the hurricane out of Juke's ear began, Take the hands with you, and left off unexpectedly. What could I do with them, sir? A harsh, abrupt, imperious clang exploded suddenly. The three pairs of eyes flew up to the telegraph dial to see the hand jump from full to stop, as if snatched by a devil. And then these three men in the engine room had the intimate sensation of a check upon the ship, of a strange shrinking, as if she had gathered herself for a desperate leap. Stop her, bellowed Mr. Rout. Nobody, not even Captain McWhirr, who alone on deck had caught sight of a white line of foam coming on at such a height that he couldn't believe his eyes. Nobody was to know the steepness of that sea and the awful depth of the hollow the hurricane had scooped out behind the running wall of water. It raced to meet the ship, and, with a pause as of girding the loins, the Nanshan lifted her bows and leaped. The flames and all the lamps sank, darkening the engine room. One went out. With a tearing crash and a swirling, raving tumult, tons of water fell upon the deck, as though the ship had darted under the foot of a cataract. Down there they looked at each other, stunned, swept from end to end by God, bawled Jukes. She dipped into the hollow straight down, as if going over the edge of the world. The engine room toppled forward menacingly, like the inside of a tower nodding in an earthquake. An awful racket of iron things falling came from the stockhold. She hung on this appalling slant long enough for Beale to drop on his hands and knees and begin to crawl as if he meant to fly on all fours out of the engine room, and for Mr. Rout to turn his head slowly, rigid, cavernous, and with the lower jaw dropping. Jukes had shut his eyes, and his face in a moment became hopelessly blank and gentle, like the face of a blind man. At last she rose slowly, staggering, as if she had to lift a mountain with her bows. Mr. Rout shut his mouth. Jukes blinked, and little Beale stood up hastily. Another one like this, and that's the last of her, cried the chief. He and Jukes looked at each other, and the same thought came into their heads. The captain. Everything must have been swept away. Steering gear gone, ship like a log, all over directly. Rush, ejaculated Mr. Rout thickly, glaring with enlarged doubtful eyes at Juke, who answered him by an irresolute glance. The clang of the telegraph gong soothed them instantly. The black hand dropped in a flash from stop to full. Now then, Beale, cried Mr. Rout. The steam hissed low. The piston rod slid in and out. Jukes put his ear to the tube. The voice was ready for him. It said, pick up all the money. Bear a hand now. I'll want you up here. And that was all. Sir, called up Jukes. There was no answer. He staggered away like a defeated man from the field of battle. He had got, in some way or other, a cut above his left eyebrow, a cut to the bone. He was not aware of it in the least. Quantities of the China Sea, large enough to break his neck for him, had gone over his head, had cleaned, washed, and salted that wound. It did not bleed, but only gaped red. And this gash over the eye, his disheveled hair, the disorder of his clothes gave him the aspect of a man 
worsted in a fight with fists. Go to pick up the dollars, he appealed to Mr. Rout, smiling pitifully at random. What's that? asked Mr. Rout wildly. Pick up? I don't care. Then, quivering in every muscle with an exaggeration of paternal tone, go away now for God's sake. You deck people drive me silly. There's that second mate been going for the old man, don't you know? Your fellows are going wrong for want of something to do. At these words, Juke discovered in himself the beginnings of anger, want of something to do indeed. Full of hot scorn against the chief, he turned to go the way he had come. In the stokehold, the plump donkey man toiled with his shovel mutely, as if his tongue had been cut out. But the second was carrying on like a noisy, undaunted maniac, who had preserved his skill in the art of stoking under a marine boiler. Hello, you wandering officer. Hey, can't you get some of your slush slingers to wind up a few of them ashes? I'm getting choked w with them here. Curse it. Hello. Hey, remember the articles, sailors and firemen, to assist each other. Hey, do you hear? Jukes was climbing out frantically, and the other, lifting up his face after him, howled, Can't you speak? What are you poking about here for? What's your game, anyhow? A frenzy possessed Jukes. By the time he was back amongst the men in the darkness of the alleyway, he felt ready to wring all their necks at the slightest sign of hanging back. The very thought of it exasperated him. He couldn't hang back. They shouldn't. The impetuosity with which he came amongst them carried them along. They had already been excited and startled at all his comings and goings by the fierceness and rapidity of his movements, and more felt than seen in his rushes. He appeared formidable, busied with matters of life and death that brooked no delay. At his first word he heard them drop into the bunker one after another obediently, with heavy thumps. They were not clear as to what would have to be done. What is it? What is it? they were asking each other. The boatswain tried to explain. The sounds of a great scuffle surprised them, and the mighty shocks reverberating awfully in the black bunker kept them in mind of their danger. When the boatswain threw open the door, it seemed that an eddy of the hurricane stealing through the iron sides of the ship had set all these bodies whirling like dust. There came to them a confused uproar, a tempestuous tumult, a fierce mutter, gusts of screams dying away, and the tamping of feet mingling with the blows of the sea. For a moment they glared amazed, blocking the doorway. Jukes pushed through the, them brutally. He said nothing and simply darted in. Another lot of coolies on the ladder, struggling suicidally to break through the battened hatch to a swamp deck, fell off as before, and he disappeared under them like a man overtaken by a landslide. The boatswain yelled excitedly, Come along, get that mate. He'll be trampled to death. Come on. They charged in, stamping on breasts, on fingers, on faces, catching their feet in heaps of clothing, kicking broken wood. But before they could get hold of him, Jukes emerged waist-deep in a multitude of clawing hands. In the instant, he had been lost to view. All the buttons of his jacket had gone. Its back had got split up to the collar. His waist had been torn open. The central struggling mass of Chinamen went over to the roll, dark, instinct, helpless, with a wild gleam of many eyes in the dim light of the lamps. Leave me alone, damn you. I am all right, screeched Jukes. Drive them forward. Watch your chance when she pitches. Forward with them. Drive them against the bulkhead. Jam them up. The rush of the sailors into the seething tween deck was like a splash of cold water into a boiling cauldron. The commotion sank for a moment. The bulk of Chinamen were locked in such a compact scrimmage that linking their arms and aided by an appalling dive of the ship, the seamen sent it forward in one great shove. Like a solid block, behind their backs small clusters and loose bodies tumbled from side to side. The boatswain performed prodigious feats of strength. With his long arms open, 
and each great paw clutching at a stanchion, he stopped the rush of seven entwined Chinamen rolling like a boulder. His joints cracked, he said, ha, and they flew apart, but the carpenter showed the greater intelligence. Without saying a word to anybody, he went back into the alleyway to fetch several coils of cargo gear he had seen there, chain and rope. With these, lifelines were rigged. There was really no resistance. The struggle, however it began, had turned into a scramble of blind panic. If the coolies had started up after their scattered dollars, they were by that time fighting only for their footing. They took each other by the throat merely to save themselves from being hurled about. Whoever got a hold anywhere would kick at the others who caught at his legs and hung on till a roll sent them flying together across the deck. The coming of the white devils was a terror, had they come to kill. The individuals, torn out of the ruck, became very limp in the seamen's hands. Some, dragged aside by the heels, were passive like dead bodies, with open, fixed eyes. Here and there a coolie would fall on his knees as if begging for mercy. Several, whom the excess of fear made unruly, were hit with hard fists between the eyes and cowered, while those who were hurt submitted to rough handling, blinking rapidly without a plaint. Faces streamed with blood. There were raw places on the shaven heads, scratches, bruises, torn wounds, gashes. The broken porcelain out of the chest was mostly responsible for the latter. Here and there, a Chinaman, wild-eyed with his tail unplated, nursed a bleeding soul. They had been ranged closely after having been shaken into submission, cuffed a little to allay excitement, addressing in gruff words of encouragement that sounded like promises of evil. They sat on the deck in ghastly, drooping rows, and at the end the carpenter, with two hands to help him, moved busily from place to place, setting taut and hitching the lifelines. The boatswain, with one leg and one arm embracing a stanchion, struggled with a lamp pressed to his breast, trying to get a light, and growling all the time like an industrious gorilla. The figures of seamen stooped repeatedly with the movements of gleaners, and everything was being flung into the bunker. Clothing, smashed wood, broken china, and the dollars, too, gathered up in men's jackets. Now and then a sailor would stagger towards the door with his arms full of rubbish, and dolorous slanting eyes followed his movements. With every roll of the ship, the long rows of sitting celestials would sway forward brokenly, and her headlong dives knocked together the line of shaven poles from end to end. When the wash of water rolling on the deck died away for a moment, it seemed to Jukes, yet quivering from his exertions, that in his mad struggle down there he had overcome the wind somehow, that a silence had fallen upon the ship, a silence in which the sea struck thunderously at her sides. Everything had been cleared out of the tween deck, all the wreckage, as the men said. They stood erect and tottering above the level of heads and drooping shoulders. Here and there a coolie sobbed for his breath. Where the high light fell, Jukes could see the salient ribs of one, the yellow, wistful face of another. Bowed necks would meet a dull stare directed at his face. He was amazed that there had been no corpses. But the lot of them seemed at their last gasp, and they appeared to him more pitiful than if they had been all dead. Suddenly, one of the coolies began to speak. The light came and went on his lean, straining face. He threw his head up like a baying hound. From the bunker came the sounds of knocking and the tinkle of some dollars rolling loose. He stretched out his arm. His mouth yawned black and the incomprehensible guttural hooting sounds that did not seem to belong to a human language penetrated Jukes with a strange emotion as if a brute had tried to be eloquent. Two more started mouthing what seemed to Jukes fierce denunciations. The others stirred with grunts and growls. Jukes ordered the hands out of the tween decks hurriedly. He left last himself backing through the door while the grunts rose to a loud murmur and the hands were extended after him as after a malefactor. The boatswain shot the bolt and remarked uneasily, Seems as if the wind had dropped, sir. 
The seamen were glad to get back into the alleyway. Secretly, each of them thought that at the last moment he could rush out on deck, and that was a comfort. There is something horribly repugnant in the idea of being drowned under a deck. Now they had done with the Chinamen, they again became conscious of the ship's position. Jukes, on coming out of the alleyway, found himself up to the neck in the noisy water. He gained the bridge and discovered he could detect obscure shapes as if his sight had become preternaturally acute. He saw faint outlines. They recalled not the familiar aspect of the Nan Shan, but something remembered, an old dismantled steamer he had seen years ago rotting on a mud bank. She recalled that wreck. There was no wind, not a breath, except the faint currents created by the lurches of the ship. The smoke tossed out of the funnel was settling down upon her deck. He breathed it as he passed forward. He felt the deliberate throb of the engines and heard small sounds that seemed to have survived the great uproar, the knocking of broken fittings, the rapid tumbling of some piece of wreckage on the bridge. He perceived dimly the squat shape of his captain holding on a twisted bridge rail, motionless and swaying as if rooted to the planks. The unexpected stillness of the air oppressed Jukes. We have done it, sir, he gasped. Thought you would, said Captain McWhorter. Did you, murmured Jukes to himself. Wind fell at once, went on the captain. Jukes burst out. If you think it was an easy job, but his captain, clinging to the rail, paid no attention. According to the books, the worst is not yet over. If most of them hadn't been half dead with seasickness and fright, not one of us would have come out of that tween deck alive, said Jukes. Had to do what's fair by them, mumbled McWhir, stolidly. You don't find everything in books. Why, I believe they would have risen on us if I hadn't ordered the hands out of that pretty quick, continued Jukes with warmth. After the whisper of their shouts, their ordinary tones, so distinct, rang out very loud to their ears in the amazing stillness of the air. It seemed to them they were talking in a dark and echoing vault. Through a jagged aperture in the dome of clouds, the light of a few stars fell on the black sea, rising and falling confusedly. Sometimes the head of a watery cone would topple on board and mingle with the rolling flurry of them on the swamp deck, and the Nan Shan wallowed heavily at the bottom of a circular cistern of clouds. This ring of dense vapors, gyrating madly around the calm of the center, encompassed the ship like a motionless and unbroken wall of an aspect inconceivably sinister. Within the sea, as if agitated by an internal commotion, leaped in peaked mounds that jostled each other, slapping heavily against her sides, and a low moaning sound, the infinite plaint of the storm's fury, came from beyond the limits of the menacing calm. Captain McWhir remained silent, and Jukes' ready ear caught suddenly the faint, long-drawn roar of some immense wave rushing unseen under that thick blackness which made the appalling boundary of his vision. Of course, he started resentfully. They thought we had caught at the chance to plunder them, of course. He said, pick up the money. Easier said than done. They couldn't tell what was in our heads. We came in, smash, right into the middle of them had to do it by a rush. As long as it's done, mumbled the captain without attempting to look at Jukes, had to do what's fair. We shall find yet there's the devil to pay when this is over, said Jukes, feeling very sore. Let them only recover a bit and you'll see. They will fly at our throats, sir. Don't forget, sir, she isn't a British ship now. These brutes know it well, too. Damn Siamese flag. We are on board all the same, remarked Captain McWhir. The trouble's not over yet, insisted Jukes prophetically, reeling and catching on. She's a wreck, he added faintly. The trouble's not over yet, assented Captain McWhir, half aloud. Look out for her a minute. Are you going off the deck, sir? asked Jukes hurriedly, as if the storm were sure to pounce upon him as soon as he had been left alone with the ship. He watched her, battered and solitary, laboring heavily in a wild scene of mountainous black waters lit by the gleams of 
distant worlds. She moves slowly, breathing into the still core of the hurricane, the excess of her strength in a white cloud of steam, and the deep-toned vibration of the escape was like the defiant trumpeting of a living creature of the sea, impatient for the renewal of the contest. It ceased suddenly. The still air moaned. Above Juke's head, a few stars shone into a pit of black vapors. The inky edge of the cloud disk frowned upon the ship under the patch of glittering sky. The stars, too, seemed to look at her intently, as if for the last time, and the cluster of their splendor sat like a diadem on a lowering brow. Captain McWhir had gone into the chart room. There was no light there, but he could feel the disorder of that place where he used to live tidily. His armchair was upset. The books had tumbled out on the floor. He scrunched a piece of glass under his boot. He groped for the matches and found a box on a shelf with a deep ledge. He struck one and, puckering the corners of his eyes, held out the little flame towards the barometer whose glittering top of glass and metals nodded at him continuously. It stood very low, incredibly low, so low that Captain McWhir grunted. The match went out, and hurriedly he extracted another with thick, stiff fingers. Again a little flame flared up before the nodding glass and metal of the top. His eyes looked at it, narrowed with attention, as if expecting an imperceptible sign. With his gray face he resembled a booted and misshapen pagan burning incense before the oracle of a joss. There was no mistake, it was the lowest reading he had ever seen in his life. Captain McWhir emitted a low whistle. He forgot himself till the flame diminished to a blue spark, burned his fingers, and vanished. Perhaps something had gone wrong with the thing. There was an aneroid glass screwed above the couch. He turned that way struck another match and discovered the white face of the other instrument looking at him from the bulkhead, meaningly not to be gainsaid, as though the wisdom of men were made unerring by the indifference of matter. There was no room for doubt now. Captain McWhir pshawed at it and threw the match down. The worst was to come then, and if the books were right, this worst would be very bad. The experience of the last six hours had enlarged his conception of what heavy weather could be. It'll be terrific, he pronounced mentally. He had not consciously looked at anything by the light of the matches except at the barometer, and yet somehow he had seen that his water bottle and the two tumblers had been flung out their stand. It seemed to give him a more intimate knowledge of the tossing the ship had gone through. I wouldn't have believed it, he thought and his table had been cleared too, his rulers, his pencils, the inkstand, all the things that had made their safe, appointed places, they were gone, as if a mischievous hand had plucked them out one by one and flung them on the wet floor. The hurricane had broken in upon the orderly arrangements of his privacy. This had never happened before, and the feeling of dismay reached the very seat of his composure and the worse was to come yet. He was glad the trouble in the tween deck had been discovered in time. If the ship had to go after all, then at least she wouldn't be going to the bottom with a lot of people in her fighting teeth and claw. That would have been odious. And in that feeling there was a humane intention and a vague sense of the fitness of things. These instantaneous thoughts were yet in their essence heavy and slow partaking of the nature of the man. He extended his hand to put back the matchbox in its corner of the shelf. There were always matches there, by his order. The steward has it his instructions impressed upon him long before. A box, just there, see. Not so very full. Or I can put my hand on it, steward. Might want a light in a hurry. Can't tell on board ship what you might want in a hurry, mind now. And, of course, on his side, he would be careful to put it back in its place scrupulously. He did so now, but before he removed his hand, it occurred to him that perhaps he would never have occasion to use that box any more. The vividness of the thought checked him, and for an infinitesimal fraction of a second, his fingers closed again on the small object 
as though it had been the symbol of all these little habits that chain us to the weary round of life. He released it at last, and letting himself fall on the city, listened for the first sounds of returning wind. Not yet, he heard only the wash of water, the heavy splashes, the dull shocks of the confused seas boarding his ship from all sides. She would never have a chance to clear her decks. But the quietude of the air was startlingly tense and unsafe, like a slender hair holding a sword suspended over his head. By this awful pause, the storm penetrated the defenses of the man and unsealed his lips. He spoke out in the solitude and pitch darkness of the cabin, as if addressing another being awakened within his breast. I shouldn't like to lose her, he said half aloud. He sat unseen, apart from the sea, from his ship, isolated, as if withdrawn from the very current of his own existence, where such freaks as talking to himself surely had no place. His palms reposed on his knees. He bowed his short neck and puffed heavily, surrendering to a strange sensation of weariness he was not enlightened enough to recognize for the fatigue of mental stress. From where he sat, he could reach the door of a washstand locker. There should have been a towel there. There was. Good. He took it. Out. Wiped his face. And afterwards went on rubbing his wet head. He toweled himself with energy in the dark, and then remained motionless, with a towel on his knees. A moment passed, of a stillness, so profound that no one could have guessed there was a man sitting in that cabin. Then a murmur arose. She may come out of it yet. When Captain McWhirr came out on deck, which he did brusquely, as though he had suddenly become conscious of having stayed away too long, the calm had lasted already more than fifteen minutes, long enough to make itself intolerable even to his imagination. Jukes, motionless on the forepart of the bridge, began to speak at once, his voice, blank and forced as though he were talking through hard-set teeth, seemed to flow away on all sides into the darkness, deepening again upon the sea. I had the wheel relieved. Hackett began to sing out that he was done. He was lying in there alongside the steering gear with a face like death. At first I couldn't get anybody to crawl out and relieve the poor devil. That bosun's worse than no good, and I always said. Thought I would have had to go myself and haul out one of them by the neck. Ah well, muttered the captain. He stood watchfully by Juke's side. The second mate's in there, too, holding his head. Is he hurt, sir? No, crazy, said Captain McWhirr curtly. Looks as if he had a tumble, though. I had to give him a push, explained the captain. Jukes gave an impatient sigh. It will come very sudden, said McWhirr, and from over there, I fancy. God only knows, though. These books are only good to muddle your head and make you jumpy. It will be bad, and there's an end, if we only can steam her round in time to meet it. A minute passed. Some of the stars winked rapidly and vanished. You left them pretty safe, began the captain abruptly, as the silence were unbearable. Are you thinking the coolies, sir? I rigged lifelines always across that tween deck. Did you? Good idea, Mr. Jukes. I didn't think you cared to. No, said Jukes. The lurching of the ship cut his speech as though somebody had been jerking him around while he talked. How I got on with that infernal job. We did it, and it may not matter in the end. Had to do what's fair for all. They are only Chinamen give them the same chance with ourselves, hang it all. She isn't lost yet. Bad enough to be shut up below in a gale. That's what I thought when you gave me the job, sir, interjected Jukes moodily. Without being battered to pieces, pursued Captain McWhirr, with rising vehemence. Couldn't let that go on in my ship if I knew she hadn't five minutes to live. Couldn't bear it, Mr. Jukes. A hollow, echoing noise like that of a shout rolling in a rocky chasm, approached the ship and went away again. The last star, blurred and enlarged, as if returning to the fiery mist of its beginning, struggled with the colossal depth of blackness hanging above the ship and went out. 
Now for it, muttered Captain McWhorter. Mr. Jukes, here, sir. The two men were growing indistinct to each other. We must trust her to go through it and come out on the other side. That's plain and straight. There's no room for Captain Wilson's storm strategy here. No, sir. She will be smothered and swept again for hours, mumbled the captain. There's not much left by this time above deck for the sea to take away, unless you or me. Both, sir, whispered Jukes breathlessly. You are always meeting trouble halfway, Jukes, Captain McWhorter remonstrated quaintly, though it's a fact that the second mate is no good. Do you hear, Mr. Jukes? You would be left alone if... Captain McWhorter interrupted himself, and Jukes, glancing on all sides, remained silent. Don't you be put out by anything, the captain continued, mumbling rather fast. Keep her facing it. They may say what they like, but the heaviest seas run with the wind facing it, always facing it. That's the way to get through. You're a young sailor. Face it. That's enough for any man. Keep a cool head. Yes, sir, said Jukes, with a flutter of the heart. In the next few seconds, the captain spoke to the engine room and got an answer. For some reason, Jukes experienced an excess of confidence, a sensation that came from outside like a warm breath, and made him feel equal to every demand. The distant muttering of the darkness stole into his ears. He noted it unmoved out of that sudden belief in himself as a man safe and assured of mail would watch a point. The ship labored without intermission amongst the black hills of water, paying with this hard tumbling the price of her life. She rumbled in her depths, shaking a white plummet of steam into the night, and Juke's thoughts skimmed like a bird through the engine room, or Mr. Rout, good man, was ready. When the rumbling ceased, it seemed to him that there was a pause of every sound, a dead pause in which Captain McWhorter's voice rang out startlingly. What's that? A puff of wind? It spoke much louder than Jukes had ever heard it before. On the bow. That's right. She may come out of it yet. The mutter of the winds drew near a pace in the forefront, could be distinguished or drowsy waking plaint passing on, and far off, the growth of a multiple clamor, marching and expanding. There was the throb, as of many drums in it, a vicious rushing note, and like the chant of a tramping multitude. Jukes could no longer see his captain distinctly. The darkness was absolutely piling itself upon the ship. At most, he made out movements, a hint of elbows spread out, of a head thrown up, Captain McWhorter was trying to do up the top button of his oilskin coat with unwanted haste. The hurricane, with its power to madden the seas, to sink ships, to uproot trees, to overturn strong walls, and dash the very birds of the air to the ground, had found this taciturn man in its path, and doing its utmost had managed to wring out a few words. Before the renewed wrath of wind swooped on his ship, Captain McWhorrell was moved to declare, in a tone of vexation, as it were, I wouldn't like to lose her. He was spared that annoyance.